Hello and good morning. Hello and good morning. Hello and good morning. Hello and good morning. No hello's from anybody else. Hello. hello. Got another hello. All right, we're good. If I say a word, can you all tell me what it means? No. <laughs> perfect. What is perfect? The somebody is one of the best. Mm-hmm. Like can't nothing. It's the best. Like those flowers are the best. <laughs> perfect. So when I think of perfect, I think of something that has no flaws, no blemishes. Imagine a fresh sheet of paper just pulled right out of the package. Has nothing on it, right? How about freshly fallen snow? It's just that nice blanket of perfect. <coughs> Got nothing on it. <clears throat> It just, yes, it's a little cold, but, but it looks perfect. Now, are we perfect? No. no nobody. nobody is? Are you, Jesus. are you sure? God. Jesus was perfect. Jesus is the only one that ever lived a perfect life. Only person in the world that ever lived a perfect life. No, he got killed. He did. He was sent. The Lord allowed him to be sacrificed because he was so perfect. For all of our sins. Exactly. He was so perfect that he was the perfect sacrifice to absorb all of our sins. So we know we're not perfect, but we strive to be perfect. We try to be perfect. Right? We try not to sin, but we know we're going to fail because the only perfect one was who? Jesus. That's right. Let's pray, guys. Father God, thank you for our children. God, help them to try to live as close to perfection as they can, like you command us to do in your Bible. Lord, forgive us where we fail you, and in your name we ask. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Flat Lake Baptist Church, March the 20th service. If you would, pick up your hymnals and turn to number 349. Number 349, as we stand. Precious bleeding sign. 
Please remain standing for opening prayer. Ask Brother Gary if he'd lead us, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you give us. Thank you, Lord, that we have a place to come and gather together and worship you. Many places in the world, Lord, that do not have that privilege. We pray especially, Lord, for what they're going through just be with those people over there keep them safe if at all possible and if it be that will that peace will come soon be with those in our country Lord that are still being infected by this virus each one of those be with our first responders, our law enforcement, our firemen, people that put their life on the line each day to try to protect us. Especially, Lord, be with those that are lost. Help them, Lord, to see that they need you and it will cause them to live a better life. We just pray the pastor, the preacher this morning, Lord, as he brings a message, give him the words to say that will help us, Lord, in our daily lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Let's see, birthdays is this week. <clears throat> Look like uh, Dakota Lee, Lee Wiley. Let's see Luke Withington next Sunday. Like Don had one this week. We'll make sure we sing to him. Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Uh, evening service this evening at 6 o'clock, uh, also with choir practice. Our Wednesday evening services will resume later as we uh, move forward. Any other announcements this morning? Any events or any announcements to make? Prayer requests this morning. Margaret McKinney, she had been in the hospital and had pneumonia. I didn't know it till I called her. Anybody else? Summerlin Cheek. Summerlin Cheek? Anyone else? If not, let's turn to number 313. Jesus. 
to ask your ushers to come forward this, this time to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with thankful hearts for this wonderful opportunity we have to be in thy house. We ask that you take this offering this morning, if it be thy will, Lord, multiply it, use it as you would see fit, best fit. We thank you for all that you've done for this church. Be thy will, continue to bless us as we continue forward. May we continue to win lost souls to God. Thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. amen. Number 327.
Brother Josh and Abby's going to sing a song this morning. They sung this southern night when they was here, and I've still got goosebumps from that one, so I asked them to sing it again. And uh, after they sang, Brother Josh will be bringing our morning message. Go ahead, brother.
cheery bunch this morning. <laughs> I've already gotten, uh, I think, oh, hold on, I hit a button. There we go. I've already gotten three compliments on my shirt this morning, and I told everybody uh, three more payments, and it's mine. But uh, I, what I'm trying to do is I see the sunshine, and I'm really trying to bring spring around. Uh, last time I wore this, I had to be careful. I attracted about half a dozen bees trying to get some nectar or something like that. So, no, I... I, I'm truly thankful to be here this morning and, and thankful for all of you. Um, turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Now, there's several other verses and, and passages of Scripture that I'll probably be jumping around to, but uh, Mark chapter 8 is kind of where our, our main passage is coming from. And If you're a, if you're a note taker, then I'll, I'll, everywhere I'm jumping to, I'll be sure to to let you know where that's at, because um, it's all uh, good reading and good scripture, of course. But um, Mark chapter 8, and we're going to be in verse 34. Mark eight thirty-four says this, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, so this is Jesus, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And I'd, I'd like to um, preach this morning on the thought, how much for your soul? How much for your soul? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you once again to be gathered here together on an absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning that we're able to gather and worship together, Lord, for, um, for each one that's here. I pray a special blessing and I pray that we would understand what you would have us to understand, that I would get the message across that you would have me to get across and that it would, uh, uh, Lord, not be me standing in the way of anything, but rather it would just be your word speaking. And we thank you and praise you again, Father, for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the creation account in the book of Genesis, we, we get an account of how God made everything that we see. And sometimes that's a little hard for me to get my mind around. Uh, I like to think of myself as being somebody that's somewhat creative. Uh, I like to think that I can maybe build some little models or, or as a kid if you gave me scotch tape and cardboard and construction paper I could make you absolutely whatever that you wanted usually it turned into a gun because that's just that's what happened but uh, uh, I, I like to think of myself somewhat as a, a as a creative person but when I think about how God before there was anything saw into the, just the, the nothingness, and he spoke the words, let there be light. And with that, he, he, he didn't just cause light to shine, but he actually brought light into existence. He defined what it was. And then as the days of, of that creation week go on, we see there in that account in Genesis how he, he spoke water into existence. Plants, the fish of the sea, the birds in the air, all the animals that walk around. And on that sixth day, he did something a little bit differently. In Genesis 2, 7, it says this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became 
a living soul. By forming us with his own hands and by putting his own breath in us, there was something very different about mankind, about human beings. Something that separated us from the rest of this beautiful creation that he had made. We're more than just a body that's kept alive by its vital organs. Um, we're more than just these beings that are, are, are just driven by the self-preservation of our own bodies. Even animals, they have a brain and they have an instinct. They can, they can hunt, they, they have an instinct to stay alive, to defend themselves. They can gather and store food. They can even raise a family and train their young. But there's something very important that separates us from the animals. We have an element about each of us that is not just something physical. The Bible calls it there in Genesis 2-7, the living soul. Because the soul is something spiritual. The soul is something that can't be seen with just our natural human eyes. And the Bible has a lot to say about the importance of our souls and what they are. And there's a few things, kind of three big points that the Bible really drives home about the soul, about the spiritual side of who we are as humans. And the first is this, that the soul is eternal. Uh, many, many years ago, there was a company, as many companies do, trying to increase their sales, increase their profits, and they came up with this slogan, a diamond is forever. You've probably heard this yourself. And several generations after that kind of bought into this, this idea that a diamond lasts forever. A diamond is something that's forever. But really, we know, I know from seeing videos on the internet of these big hydraulic machines, and they come and they crush this thing and they turn it into powder, a diamond can be physically destroyed just like anything else can. It might take a little more work, but it can be destroyed. And we know as Christians, if we believe like the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3, that all the elements are one day going to be destroyed with fervent heat, that everything that we see physically here on earth is going to cease to exist. But the soul, the soul is something special. We know from that creation account in Genesis that it was given to us by God. And if we truly believe that God himself is eternal, and I don't think there's anyone in this room who would dispute that fact, that God is eternal and that he is a spiritual being because in, in John 4, 24, it tells us that, that God is a spirit and those that worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. Then this spiritual element that he's given to us has to also be eternal, it has to last forever. Something that will never cease to exist. But if we all have that, how can that be? Because we know that our physical bodies are most certainly not going to last forever. Our physical bodies are not eternal. Uh, it's, it's the reality of life and the reality of, of, of the curse brought about by man's sin that uh, sickness, trauma, or just age can cause our bodies to to die and to decay. So to understand that, we have to learn the, the second big thing. We know the soul is eternal. Secondly this, the soul will one day be separated from our physical bodies. Ecclesiastes 12, seven tells us that one day our spirit will return to God who gave it to us. And Paul gives a wonderful example of this in the New Testament. And he's comparing our bodies to being a temporary housing for the soul. And turn with me there to the book of 2 Corinthians. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is some very familiar scripture here. Um, but I think if we truly grasped, uh, grasped exactly what it means... Um, then it takes on a whole new light and it becomes in the context of our soul and, and, and being a spiritual being in a physical body. It, it, 
it gives us a whole new outlook on our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 says this, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Uh, jumping on down here to verse 6, he says this, Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And we hear this verse quoted a lot at, at funerals, honestly, because it's a comforting thing. If we're a Christian, if the, if the person who's lying in that casket is a Christian, it's a comfort to know that our soul's eternal home, when it's separated from this physical body, is going to be with the very one who created it. It's a comfort to know that. And if we've accepted that free gift of salvation offered to us, then we can have that same comfort to know that one day there's going to be that separation of soul and body. But it's a sobering thought when we hear it put this way. In Hebrews 9, 27, he says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And that means that we're going to be held responsible for the decisions that we made while in this physical body here on the earth. And because of the sin of Adam and Eve back in the garden, it's greatly affected those decision-making skills that we have. We have, as the human race, forgotten our Creator. We've forgotten the one who breathed his life into us. And we found ourselves, myself included, chasing after things that bring us immediate satisfaction. We call it the, the TV dinner world, where we want to have it just like that. And if it feels good now, do it now. But unfortunately for us, those things are still only temporary. And that's why Jesus posed the question that he did in that passage that I read at the very beginning there in Mark chapter 8. In verse 36, he asks, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And if that was such an important point for Jesus to drive home, such an important question for him to ask, then it means that there must be something very, very valuable about the soul that we've been given. And that brings us to the third important bit of information about our souls. We, we know that the soul is eternal. It lasts forever. And we know that one day it's going to be separated from the physical body. And lastly, we know that the soul has great worth. See, the world... It's trying to pull you, trying to pull me, trying to pull all of us in many, many different directions. And it's not just sin. It can be commitments. Uh, sometimes I think one of the most depressing, discouraging, one of the most anxiety-ridden things that we can do as a human is to overcommit ourselves. We start saying yes to everything. We haven't learned to say no yet. And we just, we get spread so thin that we start leaving out that time for God. And even in sinful things as well, the, the world is trying to distract us. It's, it's given us promises of, of chasing after wealth, promises of prosperity, uh, these fleeting moments of happiness, highs that are soon going to turn into lows. But chasing after all of those things really only leads us to disappointment because as we said earlier, those things are only temporary. And if we're chasing after sin and we're rejecting God, then ultimately, that leads to death. And if we know in that verse earlier that after death comes the judgment, 
and we know that judgment is waiting just on the other side of death, that's a very sobering thought because to meet a perfect God, loving though he may be, he is still perfect and perfectly just. And to meet a perfect God after death as our judge with a soul that has been sold to the world means that there has to be punishment. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. And in Matthew 10.28, uh, the Bible talks about the death of the soul in hell. Which is an interesting phrase, the death of the soul. Because we already know, we established the soul is something that lasts forever. You know, the Bible contains many descriptions of hell. It's actually something that Jesus spoke up quite a lot in his earthly ministry. And the pictures that we have as hell are, are, are a place of a place of fire, of torment, weeping, darkness, pain, and I think those are all accurate descriptions. But to me, this idea of the death of the soul is the scariest picture of all. Because if we already know that that soul lasts forever, when the Bible talks about the death of the soul, it does not mean that it ceases to exist. When you go to hell, you don't stop existing. What it means is, is that it experiences, that soul experiences in a place that is completely separated from God, a place of punishment. It experiences that agony of dying. The, the very process of death without ever achieving the finality of death. It never reaches that moment of peace where it ceases to be tormented. I think about the, the rich man and the story of the rich man and Lazarus and how the Bible talks about how he lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torments, plural. And how at that moment he was willing to do whatever it took just, just to get a drop of water on his tongue. And begged for someone to go back and to warn his family not to come to this place, to live a life differently than he had lived. So with that sobering thought in mind, I'll pose to you that same question I asked at the very beginning. How much for your soul? How much is it worth? What are you willing to give for it? Fortunately for us, that question's already been answered. Romans 5, 8 says this, But God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. This here is, is, is a uh, passage of Scripture that puts it so much more eloquently than I ever could. And it's one of those Scriptures that, that you read and you think, no, <laughs> this is, we know why this is an inspired, infallible, perfect Word of God. 1 Peter 2.22, it's talking about Jesus, talking about the one who, while we were yet sinners, commended his love towards us. 1 Peter 2.22 says this, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Just like we were talking about in the children's sermon, perfect. At the absolute perfect sacrifice. Verse 23, Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself 
to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Verse 25, highlight this, mark it, write it down, memorize it. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. His life, Jesus' life, was the price for your soul. And the good news is the, the price has already been paid. You don't have to go get an estimate on your soul. You don't have to take a guess about what it's worth. And because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, you don't have to take a guess where that soul is going to spend its eternity. You just have to accept it. There's another place in Corinthians where Paul tells us that we've been bought with a price and that because of that we're no longer our own. And it is the absolute least that we can do if we have accepted the shed blood of Jesus, if we have asked him to forgive us of our sins, then it is the least that we can do to then turn around and live our lives completely and fully and wholly for Jesus. Sold out in service to him. So that one day when this temporary physical body takes its final breath, then my soul can return to its creator. The one the Bible says here in 1 Peter, the shepherd and bishop of our souls to finally be at peace forever. What does a shepherd do? He cares for the sheep. That may seem overly simplistic, but his number one job is to make sure that those sheep are safe, to keep them gathered together in his fold, to protect them from anything, whether it be the elements or whether it be an, an animal or a robber. And if your soul is sold out for Jesus, if he has purchased you, if he has bought you, redeemed you, bought you back, then he is the shepherd of your soul. Come get us a song. My prayer is that we would live our lives in such a way, so completely sold out to Jesus, that we the world would just have no choice but to look at us and see more of Jesus than they do of us. Would you stand with us? Let's pray. Dear, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being the shepherd of our souls. You have cared for us when we could not care for ourselves. You have gathered us together in your fold and protected us, Lord, I, I'm convinced, protected us from things we probably don't even know about. From things we don't even understand. From the very attacks of the enemy. And God, I'm thankful. I'm grateful. And I'm humble because I, I know in my own self I have zero power. Zero ability to, to protect myself from the enemy's devices. But God, as our good shepherd, as the shepherd of our souls, as the one who has redeemed us and brought us back, Lord, you have all power. 
And anything that's impossible with me is still possible with you. Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged by this, that we would take to heart the gravity that the soul will live forever. And it is our choice to accept you and your gift of grace to ensure that our forever, forever home is with you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Number 334. good message. Any word from anyone before we dismiss? Don't forget our evening service at 6 o'clock. Look forward to having everyone back. If no word from anyone, ask Brother Obi Clark if he dismisses, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can be in the house of worship on this day of worship. We're thankful that we've been able to share with saints of precious faith the message that was brought to us by inspiration from the Word of God. Lord bless Josh and his wife as they consider thy work and do thy will. Help us to take to heart the message that is brought to us, but not only that, to take it and share it with other people who are not aware of the certainty of the soul. Be with our sick and our shut-ins and those who are not able to be with us and would like to be and those that have kind of lost the desire, Lord, we pray that you will encourage them to be back into the family of God. Bless this congregation. Let us be in the center of your will. This be our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.